Beautiful. Thanks, Jakob. And um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome in all the languages and the different ways that you welcome yourselves and each other in. Um, so we'll spend together around 90 minutes, and uh, we're really very excited, Justin and I, to be here together. Um, and we're thinking about this agenda, this flow, as you can see. Uh, so hopefully we can spend some time doing a, um, I mean, this, this session at the end of the day is titled Unpacking Conceptual Frameworks Around Decolonizing EdTech. So we'll spend some time around this idea of conceptual frameworks in general and within decolonization and decolonial ed tech. Um, what I want to say is we'll, we'll weave in different pauses for taking questions and reflections. And, at a, and also at a certain point, we'll do a breakout activity um, and, and do some application. Uh, but yeah, really welcome and uh, let's get started. So Justine, can we go next in slides? Yeah, beautiful. So um, there is a lot that we can say about how this, the, this series of workshops came together. But what's beautiful about it is that it has been the collaboration of so many people coming together. And it has happened on the back of a special issue that was launched by the UNESCO chair um, on decolonizing education technology. Um, so it is a special issue that is calling for academic articles um, to be published, but then we thought, if we really want to figure out, if we really want to hear new voices than the regular voices that we hear, especially when we talk about decolonizing education technology, so we might as well also um, connect with people through these workshops. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of that special issue. So this special issue is um, inviting submissions on a wide variety of things. Um, so it could be landscape or policy analysis, it could be systematic reviews, could be case studies, it could be really political economy analysis of, of education technologies. Um, it could be conceptual, it could be providing a theoretical framework. We're really extremely open um, to that, or the editorial team is rather extremely open to that and to new voices and new ways of, of potentially doing research and conceptualizing around decolonizing education technology. And the hope is that these three workshops, uh, the series of workshops that we offer could also really help you be able to submit to that journal. That, that would be amazing, but also hopefully to other journals as well. Um, okay, can we go next? Welcome to everyone who's joining. Love the interaction in the chat. Please keep it coming all throughout the 90 minutes. Um, okay, so as we talk about decolonizing education technology, we're gonna spend the rest of the 90 minutes really talking about decolonizing, uh, but let's start with setting the tone of what is education, what is technology, so particularly for that special issue around decolonizing education technology. So education is very wide. Um, it can be non-formal, it can be informal, it can be indigenous and traditional forms of learning, lifelong learning, it can be any education level. And when we talk about education technology, we're referring to what we commonly think of when we think about ed tech, um, which is like software, hardware, applications, devices. But we're also talking about a lot more than this. We're talking about the systems in which these ed tech products and services are embedded within, the policies, the programs, the structures, the, the knowledge systems or the worldviews that actually even inform the design of these ed tech products and services. Um, so those are these two terms. Can we go next, Justine? Thank you. So I just want to take a pause here a moment and acknowledge a few different dilemmas that exist as we think about um, this whole process of, you know, calling for workshops to think about conceptual frameworks in order to publish in an academic journal. Um, it's quite paradoxical, right? We want to talk about decolonizing education technology. We want to do research in new ways. We want to rethink education and deconstruct the ways in which education and technology play roles in our lives. Um, but we're doing that through publishing in, acad in academia, in, in academic articles and in places that we're also very well aware of the colonial legacies that exist within these places. And so we just cannot go forward without acknowledging that dilemma. Um, you know, we, we want to find new ways of doing research, but we also have to publish about these new ways and talk with existing ways of doing research to be able to find our own turnabout. I guess. Um, can we go next? Um, same, same for this idea of publishing. We want to find new conceptual frameworks, but to find new conceptual frameworks, we also need to know the existing conceptual frameworks. We want to hack education practices. We want to co-opt them or make them work for our own purposes and benefits in our varied geographies and in places that have silenced voices and marginalized histories. 
But to do that, we also really have to engage and use existing edtech. I mean, for example, we're here on a Zoom platform um, or whatever edtech platform we're going to use. We know it is very much implicated in a global neoliberal system. We probably know that this meeting that we currently have um, is paid, is, is paid for, is also has its own ecological footprint. So these are all dilemmas, but we also engage with them rather than shy away from them or shut down um, from them. Um, so as Audre Lorde says, you know, the black feminist who I really love, she says the, that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. But I think that we come from a different, um, can we go next, it, into also a different uh, story of, of, of possible change, which is what Moten and Harvey call the subversive intellectual. And so I'm not going to read all of this quote on the slide here, but they say that the only possible relationship today to university is a criminal one. And some of the things that they say in this quote is, and in their book, The Undercommons, to the university, I'll steal, and there I'll steal. And somewhere in the middle of the paragraph, they say, it cannot be accepted that the university is a place of enlightenment. In the face of these conditions, one can only sneak into the university and steal what one can, to abuse the hospitality, to spite its mission, to join its refugee colony, its gypsy encampment, to be in, but not off. That is the path of the subversive intellectual modern university. And that's the path we're inviting us on, you know, to use the existing tools to make the ways of being and knowing um, and discovering together. Um, thanks, we'll go next. And again, um, shout out to everyone who's commenting in the chats. Please keep them going. I love them. Keep all the chat comments coming. Um, okay, so to delve into uh, the, the meat of this, of this presentation and this, this workshop today, uh, we just want to set the ground with a few definitions. And to start with, we want to define what is coloniality and decoloniality. So, but also to go into coloniality, I have to say that coloniality is different than colonialism. So colonialism is basically the, the political and the economic relationships that nations have, where one nation um, is basically oppressive to another in a way that really um, takes over the sovereignty of another nation, right? Like settler colonialism, for example. But coloniality is actually more than that. Colonial, co coloniality, in fact, refers to long-standing patterns of power that even persist and survive colonialism. So many of our nations in Africa gained independence, right? Quote unquote independence, right? From different um, forces of settler colonialism. But, the, but there are long-standing patterns of coloniality. They are long-standing in our culture and the way we view our world. They are long-standing in the labor in our relationships uh, with each other, in the way we produce knowledge. And so we say that you can find colonial, the traces of coloniality in books, in criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, even in our self-image, in the way we aspire for life, in the way we imagine what success and happiness is, in the way we um, do performance criteria for every single industry in our lives and in our, in our countries. These are all longstanding um, coloniality effects. Now, decoloniality then would really just involve dismantling all the relationships of power that exist within all of this, uh, whether it's around knowledge, um, race, gender, um, economic uh, relationships, etc. But one major important um, emphasis of decoloniality to differentiate it, for example, from a field like post-colonialism, is how it really emphasizes on geopolitical hierarchies, that this idea of featuring in, in every analysis, the histories and the legacies of colonialism, and how it plays into modern day relationships between nations, and subsequently between different citizens and people on the planet. Can we go next? Um, <clears throat> so, I would love to invite you in the chat to tell me what would decolonizing education mean for you by not using the word decolonizing education. Use any different word. Like what when you hear decolonizing education, what is the connotation that comes to you? You know, some people use words like justice, equity. Some people use embodiment. Some people use spirituality and religion and oral traditions and intersectionality and ancestral knowledge. So. It doesn't have to be de called decolonial. You might as well be very much engaged in decolonial activities, but you're not calling it that. 
um, is the decentering dominant voices, contextualizing precisely. Please keep them coming. Um, yes, can we go next? Um, okay, and so as I said, it can take so many different forms uh, if we focus and hone into decolonizing education. It might be reclaiming identities. It might be uh, going beyond just the lingo of diversity and inclusion into actually creating pluralistic spaces, like rather than just creating one standard form of education that everybody in the planet fits into and then trying to include other people in the planet. It might be actually designing for plurality to start with. It might be problematizing Eurocentric ways of um, education discourse and of thinking about what education is and how it can be quote unquote measured. Um, it can be creating spaces of healing from colonial traumas and ancestral traumas that we have had in our lives and from oppressive education systems. So it can be many things and we're on this journey to actually discover what it is. It's not like there is a recipe or a cookbook. Can we go next? And then we can't then talk about these definitions without then linking decolonization to technology. So when we link decolonization, or particularly, sorry, when we link colonialism to technology, we then talk, talk about digital neocolonialism. And um, as my colleague Taskeen here has coined digital colonial, neocolonialism to be, is um, the use of information technology to the, and the internet by hegemonic powers as a means of indirect control or influence over a marginalized group of people or country. Um, those hegemonic powers could be nation states, they could be corporations, it could be in the form of cultural ways of neocolonialism, like, for example, having the internet favor searches for a particular language, for example. They could be economic forms of hegemony, like who owns the means of production of technology, for example. It could be different other forms of dominance. Um, technology, also part of the digital neocolonialism, is that it promotes a particular worldview that is centered within uh, privileging ways of calculative thinking and technocracy. Uh, versus, for example, different ways of looking at the world, uh, you know, including communitarian ways and factoring in a value for storytelling or oral histories, for example. Um, yeah, so those, I know those were a lot, take them in, and I will um, give it over to Taskeen now to continue taking us through conceptual framework. Thank you so much, Nariman. Um, and I also just want to emphasize that um, the, the definitions that we give are just a starting point, right? This is just what current authors are saying. And that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about today in the idea of conceptual frameworks, which is building off ideas that are existing and challenging them, critiquing them, adapting them, um, you know, taking them to the next level. Um, I also want to um, echo what Nariman said about the dilemma that we're facing and the sort of struggle we went through to try and organize this this um, this workshop today, because um, especially with the topic of conceptual frameworks, it's something that's very much part of rigor in an academic, um, you know, uh, track of how you develop a journal article. But at the same time, from a decolonial point of view, there's also the concept of entanglement and understanding that there are different knowledges and themes and topics that come up from different parts of the world, and they all entangle together. And the idea, the idea that knowledge is fluid as well. So we can be building up on different ideas. So today I wanna to talk through conceptual frameworks and you might want to know why, why did we focus on conceptual frameworks? So the first reason is that conceptual frameworks are very hard to grasp. Um, as a PhD student, I really struggled with this part, right? It's to collect data or to create a survey and things like that. Those are pretty um, standard processes. But when someone asks you to design a conceptual framework, you're like, but what, what is different between this and my literature review, right? So um, this is kind of what we're trying to unpack today. Um, the second reason that we wanted to focus on it is that in, in our call for papers, in the special issue on um, decolonizing educational technology, we want to to um, place a specific emphasis on conceptual frameworks because it'll help to develop the language and tools and ideas in order to conduct more decolonial research and to help to de decolonize this um, academic space. So what are conceptual frameworks? So um, 
as a starting point, we're talking about conceptual frameworks as something that maps relations, concepts, theories, variables um, that you're discussing in your study. And these are all used to explain the phenomenon that is happening within, within the study that you're doing. Um, and what this is, is we use this as a sort of a, the researcher's hypothesis or their starting model um, to, to build together the, the picture around a particular problem. Um, now these, these um, different tools, well, th what, what these things do is they serve as a tool to help bring these different concepts together um, and then help them bring them into the real world. So the idea of a conceptual framework is very much a model of what's happening um, in the real world. So um, there are kind of two approaches with conceptual frameworks in a specific paper. So you can use a pre-existing conceptual framework. For example, many of you in education might know um, the TPAC framework, right? Technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. And you know that's it, those three angles, and you have your conceptual framework and you don't need to do any further digging. However, in other cases, you might wanna chop and choose and take a little bit of information from here and there um, and bring them together to help understand the problem that you're talking about. Now, in research, there's two different types of approaches that you can take. Um, there are probably more than two, but the, the main two um, are deductive reasoning, reasoning and inductive reasoning. And with deductive reasoning, um, you start by developing your own idea. So you'll be looking at the literature, you'll be looking at existing theories, um, you know, and you make a hypothesis and then you collect the data and this either validates or invalidates or shows um, you know, where the gaps in a specific framework are. And then you, you confirm or you adapt your theory or your conceptual framework. The other way is to look at inductive reasoning where you start with the data collection. Right, and then from the data, you look at different um, patterns. You look at different, um, you know, trends that are emerging within this data, and then you formulate your hypothesis, and then you um, develop a conceptual framework. So, in these two different papers, an, a deductive reasoning, the conceptual framework would come at the top of the paper, and in an inductive reasoning, it would be part of your your results, your discussion, and your findings. That, that, you know, something you formed from this data. Um, so I just want to also flag that if you're interested in submitting something to the special issue, not every journal article does need a conceptual framework, uh, but in our, in, in our um, special issue, we want to focus on developing conceptual frameworks so that we can help to um, bring about new ideas and ways of thinking. You could say a conceptual framework gives, um, gives you, well, exactly what this slide is about, right? Why do we want, why do these conceptual frameworks matter? Basically, they give us the language and terminology to express something. So I was trying to think of an example and, and I thought of the word gaslighting, right? Like before like the past few years, nobody ever used that word, but you hear it describe someone's experience so much, right? When they, when they now have a word to describe the thing that's happening to them. So in the same way, when we provide words and vocabulary and concepts, um, it'll help us to express what is happening in the world. Um, it helps to give us tools to unpack and analyze the situation. Um, it also explains and predicts the way that concepts will come together, right? So it's helping to map out the relation, the cause and effects of different things. And it also shapes the direction of your study. So, Although we're emphasizing conceptual frameworks, we do want to emphasize that they're just a model of reality and they're fluid, they're evolving. They can sometimes be time bound and they're most definitely con contextual. So what you design in, you know, in one place might not be applicable in another place. And while the idea, and this maybe is where the decolonial element comes in, while conceptual frameworks are supposed to be you know, abstracted and um, sort of universal in nature, um, they can still, they, they, they're very much contextual in, at, at the same time. So trying to understand what are these contextual elements and how might they differ. Um, the other thing is that not everything is categorizable, not everything is gonna fit into a box and we need to understand that and embrace that. But at the same time, the more and more we unpick 
the hidden assumptions or the hidden factors that are um, you know, happening within a system, the more we'll be able to make our model more realistic and, ex and express ourselves and a situation. Um, one quick example that I'll be talking about later is the concept of um, justice, right? And when we thought of justice just as redistributing resources versus looking at um, more uh, recognitive justice, for example, that actually understands parity of rights and um, different ways of looking at it. So the more we have language to describe ourselves, the more we can analyze and critique um, the social phenomena happening around us. Um, yeah, so maybe just to get a bit more practical and Nariman will be taking us through this in a, in a bit. Um, when you're developing a conceptual framework, a process that you might want to use is to start um, looking at your topic and unpacking all the keywords that are important to it, then trying to dig into existing um, literature or sources. It doesn't need to be academic. It, it could be spiritual um, sources. It could be elders in the community and understanding what frameworks or concepts that they have used. Um, then you determine, does a framework already exist for you or do you feel like you need to construct one? And once you have that, then you can start mapping all the variables that are in there. So variables might be a specific, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you some of them, like specific indicators, or it might be um, you know, broader theories that are being put together. After that, you'll then go and show the relationships between things. So what impacts what? Um, and then in the final step, which is optional, but I always find very useful is to have a graphical representation of this. Now, um, before I go on to give some examples, I also wanted to explain grounded theory, which somewhat is, is um, on a different track to conceptual frameworks. And this is something that we would also encourage using in the paper. So grounded theory is about a, is, is a research method that's aimed at generating theory. So it, so it falls under the more inductive method that I mentioned earlier, which is that you don't start with any concepts. You don't have any assumptions. You don't look at theories. You just first start with looking at a phenomenon and observing it and collecting the data and then bringing and then seeing the patterns that arise from there. Um, and so in this in this um, approach, you actually recommended to not um, look at concepts. However, we're, we're all people that are shaped by ideas and concepts, whether we knowingly or, uh, or unknowingly have been. So it's almost hard to detach yourself from any worldview or any frameworks, but that's the approach in grounded theory. And we also encourage grounded theory works because they'll help us to develop new, different out of the box conceptual frameworks that are not um, sort of tailored in a specific um, worldview. Um, so yeah, just to emphasize how um, some of the sort of little exercises we're going to do today, um, basically what you would do is bring different concepts or schools of thought together and see how they overlap and how you can merge different frameworks um, from it. So if we take um, this example, uh, let's let's say we're trying to look at um, the like you know decolonizing um, the you know um, like you know uh, apps that teach language, for example. So what you might want to do is okay. First, let's look at the literature base on minority languages. Then let's look at what's what's out there that's written about language apps. Are there any systematic reviews that exist relating to this? then we can say, okay, let's look at decolonial thinking about language, right? And then you can bring these ideas together to form your conceptual framework. Um, so one idea, one way of doing a conceptual framework is to sort of have these overlapping circles, but I also don't want to say that that's the only way. So if you look and, uh, at the, at the um, graphic on the left, you can see, in this model, they're not mapping concepts, but they're actually mapping sort of variables in a system, right? So here they have, you know, the student at the center. So this, this conceptual framework was about student engagement in, in ed tech, right? And so they have the student, they have the mic micro, meso, exo, and macro systems, and looking at factors that um, are within all of that. On the right, you have a diagram of a tree, 
And in this one, it's a decolonial framework for, um, what is it, restitutive justice. Um, and it looks at roots, trunk, branches, and fruit. So there's different ways of describing how concepts can come together. And this is um, from a paper, uh, Lesham and Trafford, that they're just kind of, you know, give, give you a whole bunch of ideas of different ways that you could illustrate um, the ideas that, that, um, that you want to sort of put together, weave together to tell your story and your hypothesis. So with that, I will pass over back to Nariman. And I hope I haven't overloaded you, but we've given you the slides so you can, you know, take a deep look. Yeah. Um, thanks, Taskeen. Uh, exactly. I just put the link to the slides again. Please, um, if you want to open them, if you can access them, um, uh, please, you can, you can go at your own pace if you want. Um, so this first part of the presentation was about conceptual frameworks in general. And next up, we're going to go into decolonizing conceptual, like particularly conceptual framework, frameworks around decolonizing education. But uh, I just wanted to take a pause. Uh, how are people? Where are you? Uh, can you put in the chat what your thoughts are at the moment, a sentence maybe that you are sitting with or a question that you have? Um, you can also take one or two shares if you want to come off mute and share a question or a thought and reflection to what Taskeen shared. But yeah, go ahead, please, and use the chat. We'd love to hear some reflections on what we shared so far. And maybe even some emotions around what happened. Caroline, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, thank you very much. This is so interesting and so more than, I mean, interesting always, but inspiring, I have to say. And I'm just, in, I say inspiring because I'm thinking, you know, what are the things we need really that we don't have? I was thinking about what is it that we, we what's not in place. But then while I was thinking this, I was also thinking that there are two things that I've been struggling with. The first one, is if we say, what are the criteria of academic performance, right? I was thinking we should not um, limit ourselves or confine ourselves to academia, because I think that if we want to decolonize educational technology or, you know, or education in, in more general, the education, really there is, there is I think that's, I have been thinking strongly, deeply, and for a long time about this. And I think what we really need to do is we need to change the direction because we need to say academia until now has expected people to go there. And they have set these parameters, da, 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 all of that, and that then sets the scene of everything. Now, what I think needs to happen is that the university or academia needs to go to the community to say one thing. And the community then will provide things that academia doesn't know and they need to learn, if that makes sense. And so yeah. in this sense, I think the direction is a different one. The direction is the university, like Freire, right. one of his right. dialectics is student and teachers have interchanging roles. And sometimes the teacher becomes the student. And if that doesn't happen, then it is never possible to learn, either for the student or for the Yeah, true, very much. It's uh, this idea of shifting power dynamics is at the heart of thinking about decoloniality, right? And just reimagining things all together. Um, Absolutely. And again, we're here for, for that reimagination. We're here for that learning. We're here for not to say this is what decoloniality looks like exactly, but to actually say, let's explore that together. And we want to learn more from what exists on the ground. There is a lot that's coming through the chat. Uh, Taskin, you wanted to say something in response to Karolina? Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay, so who decides on what is decolonizing framework in EdTech? That's a really great question. And we're gonna go into those uh, th this, this topic in a moment. Um, I appreciate, Zoe, that it's a bit fast. It's also one of those dilemmas, right? <laughs> How much do we say in very little time and still have people's attentions? But yes, the slides are there. Please go through them at your own pace. Um, and the recording also is there. Beautiful. Um, many understandings of decolonizing. Um, and I think that there is something about this idea of that the decoloniality is not a fixed thing that is that is meant to be that, because 
having a very fixed and I in so many academic journals I read I read a whole literature review that starts with we cannot find a specific literature a specific definition and so it's hard to build on what's existing but I don't think it's hard I think I think that if we get sucked as decolonial scholars into putting a standard definition then we really get sucked back into the rational standardized modern ways of producing academia, which is all about defining universal definitions for everything. But yeah, back to you, Justine. Thanks, Nari. Um, just to add on to that, um, the reason we put that slide up earlier with the little speech bubbles to um, look at different interpretations or your, you know, your experiences of it is because there is no one definition. I also wanna add to say that sometimes decolonial perspectives can be contradictory, right? They can be rooted in different um, traditions that might have conflicting theories. So deco uh, I would say at the like minimal level, decolonial lenses are about critiquing the current um, sort of world order and geopolitical dynamics. But the way in which you address those would be different and would be shaped differently. And so that's why we're really encouraging different schools of thought to sort of step out of the using the word decolonial, but understanding what it means to be decolonial. Um, so I'm going to sort of take us on a very quick tour of different um, ideas. I'm literally just going to spend a minute on the slide. And the idea is not to explain the whole framework. The idea is just to give you a taste of um, different ways that you can group and conceptualize ideas and, and sort of how um, I've done it and how some other authors have done it. So um, the first framework I want to share with you is um, from Ross and Gans, and they use the di like digital divide gap. So understanding the access gap, the usage gap, and the reception gap when it comes to the digital divide. Um, something that I use is I basically use this framework and I took it on to another layer and added a digital literacy gap. So right, looking at considering access, looking at uh, ability to use devices, to address bar barriers um, to students um, so that they can benefit equitably. So it's just an example of how you use something and then you can um, adapt it to become something more. Um, another framework that I've found very useful is the social justice from the global south, um, which is basically Hodgkinson, Williams and Trotter. And um, this is the example I was referring to earlier when um, if you look at the, the history written from the bottom, sort of from Rawls in 1971, um, going all the way to, to the present day, um, theories of justice keep on evolving. Right. And um, like I mentioned earlier, redistribution was normally the main idea of how justice was to be served, right, in terms of um, uh, redistributing resources. And just to emphasize that these theories shape politics as well. Um, and so it's quite important to, to think of the two going hand in hand, because once you bring about the words and the frameworks to understand these different elements, they, they can actually have real impact on people's lives. Um, so in this justice, social justice framework, we shifted from uh, firstly redistribution to also looking at recognition and representation, but also understanding them as ameliorative, which is sort of like treating the symptom versus transformative, which is me meaning getting to the underlay underlying issues. So moving from representation, meaning social belonging to looking at parity of rights, for example. So you can you know, look at the papers and understand these in your own time. Um, the next, from, from a more, uh, I would say Latin American roots is the colonial matrix, which looks at the coloniality of power um, and then looks at global hierarchies. Um, then also the coloniality of being, which is a very much an ontological dimension. With, well, what that means is looking at people's lived experience, right? Um, and not only something that happens in, in the mind, but actually, you know, with people's hearts and souls and how they how they um, sort of view the, the world. Um, and the third would be coloniality of knowledge, which I think in the education space is the one that we might all be uh, most familiar with, which is looking at um, sort of epistemic uh, hegemony. So understanding who decides what knowledge is, what knowledge counts, um, and the politics of, of this. A, a good example would be um, 
that um, African literature was never thought of, oh, sorry, African thinkers were never thought of as like political thought. They were sort of classed as African literature. But if you go back and you read, read them, you can see that they had very um, deep um, political undertones. So just like how you categorize something as, you know, uh, just, you know, sort of fictional literature versus um, something that's politically shaping. Um, so next up, I have this dimensions of human injustice. And I'm sharing this because this is what I worked with in my thesis. Um, and what I did was I brought um, social justice frameworks together with the decolonial frameworks. And the reason for this was because in the specific context, so in South Africa, um, the student protests were happening at that time and the word decolonizing was being thrown around quite a lot, but some people actually preferred to use the word social justice. So I tried to understand what are the difference, um, like why are they kind of these two different schools of thoughts um, and trying to unpack these different angles and then bringing them together to kind of look at like what are the underlying concepts. I, I brought this down to cultural, cultural epistemic injustices, material injustices and political and geopolitical injustices. Um, in a, in a different part of my work, I've also looked at um, justice in terms of learning design. So when you're designing a course, for example, how would you look at justice? And here I took, uh, based on the, so based on my data, I grouped things together, looking at justice as content, right? So, so thinking about when you're designing a course, how do you make sure that everything is sort of relevant to the students that you're dealing with? But then noting that when you're doing a global course, like a MOOC, you might wanna to move to something as justice as pedagogy because you have so many ideas and worldviews in the room that you know, presenting on South African history would, would sort of be an injustice to other students joining from Brazil, for example. Um, so how do you then ch change that space to um, justice as pedagogy when you learn from each other? And as Caroline was saying, like where the students become the teachers. Um, then looking at justice as process, which means not just hap what happens in the class, but how, what happens before, who decides what is going to be taught, um, who is going to teach it, um, and the barriers around that. Um, another, another sort of framework that, that I, I was using um, when, when I um, mapped out concepts in my thesis was trying to understand different layers of decolonization. And at the time that I was doing my PhD, um, the concept of decolonizing the curricula was, was very central. And for me, it felt like, oh, but this is just such a small little part of a bigger ecosystem. And what are we doing just focusing on this? So that was my starting point to understand what is, you know, what is behind decolon decolonizing, decolonization of the curricula. And so I unpacked it in terms of the university and then the bigger education system and then decolonization of many other sectors. And as you can see, each framework that you look at, you can probably be like, oh, but you probably missed something here and there. And that's exactly the point. Um, we can take these ideas and someone else can say, okay, I wanna build upon this and add this layer. Um, so yeah, the, the next set of ideas I want to share is um, the work from uh, Jonathan Jansen. And so in his book, As by Fire in 2017, um, around the same time as the student protests in South Africa, he mapped out seven different types of, um, I would say, meanings of decoloniality or, or lived experiences or um, you know, manifestations maybe. Um, so I chose three because I found those to be sort of the most distinct. It was sort of on a spectrum. Uh, and looking at these different meanings of decoloniality, it helped me to also understand why some people were averse to the word and why they preferred to use social justice rather than this. Um, so just to quickly ex talk through them, um, the first one was Africanization. So this meant like a replacement of European knowledges by local and indigenous knowledges. Um, then there was Afrocentrism, and this was talking about not replacing, but recentering African knowledges at the center and like sort of using European knowledges um, as and when needed. And then the last one is um, sort of knowledge as entang entanglement. So this was the one that I mentioned earlier, which was understanding that knowledge is sort of 
um, traveling across time and across space and it's fluid and it's evolving. Um, and, and so we can't really say that, you know, knowledge is specifically rooted in one place or another. Um, the problem with that last approach is that um, if we don't spend time properly acknowledging where knowledge is from, those, those histories can be um, sort of uh, hidden and, and sort of the knowledge of the victors will always feature more than marginalized knowledges. So with each one, there's like a framework, but also a caution to it. Um, another one of my, uh, uh, my favorite frameworks is that of um, Andriotti et al. And this kind of looks at mapping interpretations of decolonizing decol in, in higher education. So it starts off with a do nothing, and then it looks at soft reform that kind of focuses on diversity and in inclusion and, and that sort of language. And then you move to radical reform space um, where we you know, call out uh, that the game is rigged and we call out issues of racism and capitalism and neo-colonialism in systems. And the last one is like a beyond reform space when um, you know, the structures are there and um, it's deemed as un unfixable. So you might say the last one is a bit dystopian, but um, yeah, in some, in some cases you do feel stuck. So that, that was a useful framework that I found. And um, lastly, I'll just share here, um, conceptualizing types of um, different decolonial methodologies. So this one is a bit um, meta, I would say, and it's from Zavala. And so um, they uh, sort of mapped out the different, uh, you could say interlockings of different, um, uh, decolonial methodology. So starting with storytelling and counter storytelling and how turning that can then click into healing, right? Which is about uh, something that's more so social and collective and spiritual. And then that can then lead to reclaiming. And so I think this is also as we, as we sort of plug our next um, workshop, looking at some of these deco uh, deco decolonial methodologies. But in this case, I'm just trying to show it in terms of a conceptual framework. Um, so that's it for, for the quick tour. And I know, it, again, it, it's overwhelming, but it's just supposed to be tidbits to help you to, you know, find some sources to, to dig in further. So Nariman, back to you. Thanks, Taskeen. Um, so yes, we hope that this is a source of inspiration, but what's really more important, I mean, it's important to know what's out there, absolutely, but what's also more important is what are you thinking about? What is enticing you? What are the questions that are keeping you up at night and the concepts that you want to explore and the variables that you want to put together? So we'll go through a, an activity together, um, and um, so prepare to roll your sleeves, please. Uh, we'll have, it's going to be a three-part activity. Um, or three pieces, two pieces of which we're going to do individually. So you sitting at your desk, if you want to bring a pen or a paper or open up a sticky note on your on your laptop, whatever you like, um, or on your phone. Uh, but in the first two, I will guide us through an individual activity, and then in a short in in, sh in short a few minutes, we'll then go into breakouts and discuss what we've done as an individual activity together. Okay, can I have a thumbs up, uh, a, a virtual thumbs up, if that's uh, if that's all clear to everyone, or um, or a, an emoji in the chat or something. Okay, sounds good. Cool. So can we go to the first one? So for the first thing, obviously this whole exercise is going to be about how can we, you know, take a stab at putting together a conceptual framework. We're not going to come out of this, you know, upcoming twenty minutes with a conceptual framework, but we're going to take a stab at it. We're going to try it out. Um, so I'm gonna follow the same example that the scheme gave a few minutes ago. Um, we said that the first thing in putting together a conceptual framework is discovery, right? We just wanna discover what's out there. So you wanna write down the keywords that best describe what you're looking for. You know, keywords are like terms or phrases that describe the focus of what you want to look for. So they might be things like minority languages, decolonizing the mind, local languages, language learning applications, you know, it might be that. And then you want to map the authors or the articles that link to these keywords. There are many ways to research, of course, and we can send in an email, a few guides for searching smarter on the web, uh, you know, searching can give you good results. But 
basically it might be some you might since you're interested in that keyword you probably have cert have come across a resource that links to that keyword if not that's also fine you can use your phone right now or your laptop to quickly search for it uh, just on google or any other web search that you use but um yeah so for example here a keyword like local languages or minority languages maybe a corresponding article or author is Ruby with Yongo, the language of art, African literature as a foundational work in that, in that domain. Um, another one is language learning applications, which is a keyword we put in the table above. A corresponding article would be um, Hey et al, a review of mobile language learning applications, trends, challenges, and opportunity. Um, so this is just an example, but now we're gonna take three minutes um, and please take time. Maybe you can go to the next slide to see to think about that for something that you were interested to explore. What are keywords that you're interested to explore? What could be possible authors or articles that you might have heard of or you might find through a quick search right now? Go ahead. And just to say like the links are, uh, to the slides are there. So if you wanna flip back and look at different slides to help simulate yourself. Um, yeah. And now when do you wanna start a timer? Okay, everyone, um, I hope you were able to jot down your keywords and your authors. If you've done that, can you give us a thumbs up or a, or a yes in the chat or any kind of emoji in the chat? That would be amazing. Are we all together here still, hopefully? And, any proof of life so we know we still have a lot of you. <laughs> guys. Okay, it's starting to, to give a few drops. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so next up will be, Justin, if you want to go next. Next up is going to be thinking about this idea of concept mapping that Justin talked us through a bit earlier. Uh, so if we want to make a concept map for local languages or minority languages, as an example, to follow the same example, and decolonizing a language learning, as well as language learning apps. So maybe how can these different variables, different concepts come together? How can we draw a diagram that depicts the suggested relationships between these different concepts? Um, we've shared a number of diagrams and you have the slides, so you can go back to them for inspiration. But we'll give you three more minutes to think about what is a diagram that depicts the relationships between the keywords you have just jotted down. Um, is that all good? In a moment, we'll go into breakout rooms and talk about all of this and offer each other comments and feedback. But um, can you also give us any proof of life if you heard that, if it feels good to you, or, or if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Okay, there are hearts coming, which is great. <laughs> okay, three, three more minutes then to think about our concept map. So a final minute to think about this concept map and then will be in breakouts and thinking about those concepts map and keywords that matter to us in a moment. <clears throat> Jacob, it would also be great if you're ready with breakouts in a minute. Great, so to echo Matt and the chat, I really hope you're excited to share with people about what you're thinking about, what research questions are keeping you up and how you can draw the relationships between these different keywords. Um, so, can we go to the next slide to see? So we're hoping that you'll be put in groups of uh, random breakouts. So see who's with you. Um, some guidance is you can feel free to introduce yourselves. And then it would be wonderful if you start sharing what you're thinking about in terms of summarizing a conversation between the different authors that you chose. So for example, let's think you are choosing a conversation between Kugi with Nyong'o, Walter Mignolo, and I don't know, Walter Rodney or something. How would these three people talk together? Obviously, these three people um, represent three concepts. Uh, it might be also the concepts are speaking together. How would language learning speak to learning apps, to decolonizing language learning? Um, so the idea is to share in your breakout a summary of 
how these three concepts would talk together if they had gathered over a dinner table. Maybe they fought, maybe they found harmony, um, we don't know. Um, but um, it would be wonderful to, to share that in the breakouts. You can also feel free to put cameras on if that's possible, if your bandwidth allows for it. Um, yeah. Okay. Off you and go. To, yeah, just keep. Oh, uh, yeah. Just to, just to add, if you didn't come up with ideas or you're struggling, that's also fine. Just share where you are, share some of the struggles, ask others for help. Um, so don't feel stressed out about that since either. Um, okay, let's, let's break out. Yeah, and, and Zoe, by all means, we did not expect you to do your conceptual <laughs> framework in eight minutes. This was just, okay. a, this was just a, like a, a quick um, brain dump for something that will probably take you days to do. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, shall we move on? Yeah, yeah. Thanks all for sharing. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so... In the last um, few minutes, we just wanted to share a uh, quick, again, the resources will be shared, so we're not going to unpack them in detail, but um, we thought it was just like as a starting point, if we share different resource lists that at least we know about that could help you um, unpack different ideas. Again, these are not compulsory, these are not anything, but they're just a starting point. So um, I put together some lists of Latin American decolonial thinkers. So uh, Dassel, Grossvogel, Maldonado Therese, and Mignolo. Um, all of them have talked about sort of um, the, co um, the sort of the double-sided coin of modernity and coloniality, and I've unpacked those lenses in different ways. So um, I would say a lot of decolonial theories do come from them or even uh, have stemmed off some of their work around the globe, but a lot of authors have originated from there. Um, from the African continent, we've had many conversa conversations. It's really lovely to look at actually how um, people from different countries over um, sort of the the colonial periods would converse with each other. So there's um, Blyden, Chinwezu, uh, Mamdani, Fanon, Nkrumah, Ngoki, Otiongo, and um, there's many others. But if you want to look at all of these, you can just see the titles and you can go and look up these different authors to understand um, different uh, decolonial thinking. And often the, their thinking is actually quite different, right? Even within the African continent, they have different conceptions of what it means to be decolonial. And as you've seen in, like, in, in the politics that have emerged from different countries, how people have approached it differently, even in their national um, um, frameworks. Um, in, in decolonizing education, I've mentioned um, Janssen, there's Diane Simmons, who he looks through Fanon's work. Um, there's um, Ivan Illich, who looks at de-schooling society. Again, here, yeah, the word decolonial isn't used, but if you read the work, it very much embodies that sort of thinking. Um, Zavala, we've talked about before, and um, Jessica Orbach, um, looking at uh, sort of the neoliberal university as well. Um, then in terms of decolonizing edtech, we actually, like probably a year ago, have launched a website, uh, oh, sort of a blog post with a ton of links. So I'm not even gonna try and share them here, but um, you can go and look at that resource list to look at different um, fields, whether it's from AI to positionality in edtech or um, many other different angles and then, um, the other intersection, like if we have, let's say, like ed tech or education, and uh, the other main factor in geopolitics is international development, um, like who's doing these projects in different African countries that are bringing in ed tech. So we thought international development was also an important place to look at. And so um, you can see some of the work from Abdi looking at global citizenship, Kapoor looking at um, education, decolonizing a decolonization and development. Um, Hokoko, which we might talk about in the next webinar, is looking at varieties of qualitative research, particularly with decolonial lenses in them. Um, a classic is Wolfgang Sachs, the Development Dictionary. And then um, 
There's um, Arati Seprakash's work on uh, erasure of racism in education and international development and um, Walter Rodney um, and Sultana. So just looking at some of these ones. Um, so we've also put a bunch of links to different blogs that we've written. Um, and we also wanna encourage you to join, either to view or to join the Zotero library. So if you click this link, um, basically it will show up in a Zotero library. You can download the references straight away, or you can even join this community and start contributing to a decolonizing ed tech community library. Um, there's also links to previous recordings that were done on Emerge Africa and for my fist as well that cover similar topics. So if you still, so today's focus was conceptual framework, so we didn't unpack too much, but we've done previous webinars where the whole webinar has been about what does decolonizing ed tech mean. Um, so those resources and webinars are available as well. Um, yeah, and then that's it from in terms of here. Yeah, I just wanted to all the references are, are here of everything we've discussed today. And yeah, I think we can just open back up for um, Q and A, and and let's see. Um, what everyone else has to say or sort of wrap up here. Yeah. yeah, let's make it alive, everyone, please. First of all, thank you to everyone who's sending links in the chat. I see also people are asking for some references of diagrams that we've used. They're all in the slides. If we can, I'll put the link to the slides again in a moment. Um, and for everyone who's joining us again, but you can find the references there. Um, we would really love to hear you. This is really, this should not be about us speaking all that much. So. Um, thoughts, questions, ideas, uh, steps forward, um, wonderings, all welcome. You can send your question in the chat. You can feel free to unmute and um, share. We'd love to also hear different voices. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure if I'm a different voice. <laughs> Go ahead, Carly. I I, no, I, no worries. I'd invite you to share what you want and also make space for others. So it's both, yeah. but go ahead. Just to say thank you. But I've learned so much just now in this hour and 10 minutes. So I just wanted to say out loud, thank you. This has been amazing. Really appreciate it. Stay with us. We still have some great announcements. We're not done yet, but it's really, come on, you guys. This is about uh, discussing together. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pick people because I know they usually have Good thoughts. Nicola, do you have anything to share? Not just early days, but I think also the idea of counter narratives for me is something that's really resonating at the moment and been engaging on some with some stuff on digital exclusion. So yeah, still it's still settling. <laughs> but yeah, I think how do we how do we decolonize? You know, discourses around that is something that I'm interested in at the moment. That's great. And I was also chatting with someone about critiquing the colonial discourses as well, right? Because there's also, it can become quite a, a whitewashed word um, it, these days where everybody's using it, but might not uh, really embody the meaning of it. Um, Rosina, do you have anything to share? Oh, Asifa. Oh, hi, colleagues. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, a great start to the concept on its own. It's new to me. So I think uh, based on these different sessions that uh, you will organize, yeah, maybe we'll have a better contribution next time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Innocent Jamo. Sorry if I'm not saying your names correctly. No, you, you said it very well. Uh, no, uh, it's, uh, it's a new concept. Uh, I was more to follow uh, uh, in terms of how you conceptualize it. Uh, to still have, I haven't got it very well in terms of differentiation on the, the colonized and the 
and uh, the colonialism. Yeah, I think still a, a little bit of confusion because from what I also see in terms of what is bank report, it, it issues related to power. Is it decolonized looking at bringing equal power to different actors in the process? What it is exactly? So I still haven't got it very, very, very well. Very well. Thank you. It sounds exactly like you have got it. <laughs> Uh, that was that was a very good description. Azwa, uh, thank thank you very much. Uh, the very rich presentations, and uh, I learned a lot. And uh, what you most of what you said resonates with the, what I've been thinking all along in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, and especially for me, decolonizing teacher education. But uh, my challenge is, who wants decolonization? Is it us, the academics? What does the society say? How do we engage society so that they, we, we are not imposing ideas on them? That, that is the challenge that I'm finding. Uh, let me just take for an example. We had a discussion on trying to encourage teachers to use local languages. But do you find a lot of resistance? They still want to use English. Then you remove yourself and start to listen outside. You find they switch from English to indigenous languages. But if you say, why don't we use indigenous languages? They are not, <laughs> they don't like it. So, that, that has been the, the challenge to say, who wants it? Thank you. Uh, as well, that point is, is so, so relevant. I really think that alone could be like an abstract of a paper um, because the, this is something you've seen everywhere in terms of people wanting to have access to English as a global language because that gives them more opportunities in life, for example, and that's a very real, like it's a material, real thing that people need. But then what happens to local and indigenous knowledges as well? So, um, you know, and culture and and the meanings and values that are linked with with local languages. So, yeah, it's, it's almost like living a double, double life, trying to balance both. And then at a national level, trying to decide um, how are you going to take that forward? Yeah. Thank you. But that's also, I just want to pitch in here because that's that's a very important, again, I cannot emphasize how important what you said is, first of all, what is the case for decolonial education and why decolonial education? Do people really want it or do people just want to get ahead in life with the mainstream logic that exists because they want better opportunities? And who are we in it? What is our positionality to quote unquote pre preach that when we have our degrees from our universities and when we already know English and when we have already gained a head in life, who are we to tell people don't gain the same tools that we've gained for knowledge production, for example? So mm -hmm. these are all very real questions. At the same time, decolon decoloniality is a grassroots movement. It's, it's not a movement that started in academia. Decoloniality is, it, it was definitely picked up by academia, but there's a lot of we can give an example of so many social movements, um, like the Zapatismo, for example, in, um, in Latin America, or many others that can come to mind, and we can share perhaps more resources on that. Uh, but it's a grassroots movement that then got theorized in academia. Um, and then and then its implications then. Um, yeah, exactly, Justine. Um, then there is also the part around, we can't, it's, it's not easy to work with people, of course. But it's easier to ask people to change rather than to question systems and to ask systems to change or to organize collectively with people to change systems. Because what it mean, what would it mean to ask teachers to teach indigenous languages when the system doesn't support them, when the system would actually penalize them, um, when the parents would not help, help, help them with this? So perhaps we need to look at also creating, you know, there was a conversation about power also in the in the chat. And yeah. I think that acting as if we're in a world where power is neutral is siding with the hegemonic powers, obviously. So it's the question of like, 
how can power be equalized? That's an important question, but it's also how can it happen through organizing so that the, the systems mm -hmm. can allow us to do these things. Yeah. Or not allow yeah. us, we don't need permission necessarily, but you know, so that we reimagine those systems. Mm -hmm. Apologies, I get very passionate about these things. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? Okay, maybe we move on to the last little pitch. I don't know if Matt or Yato, you want to talk a bit about this? Uh, yes, for those who are still here, um, please note in the chat there the opportunity to give some feedback on this session. But also, um, in about a month's time, the 28th of April, looking to do the second workshop where I will be talking about uh, research methods in, uh, well, just in social science generally, and looking at kind of decolonizing research and taking it away from what has been called the usual suspects of the kind of interview, questionnaire, survey, case study that you see over and over again, particularly in very westernized research looking at lots of different ways to maximize participation from people. So hopefully some of you will be uh, excited about joining that one. Please spread the word if you've enjoyed this. Um, and then, yes, what I'd like to do, what I plan to do is to get some of my materials out to you beforehand so that when you turn up, there'll be a richer discussion. And what I'm going to talk to Taske, Nariman, Jacob and others about is opening up other spaces perhaps in between these workshops with all the input where we have time to discuss and have like an open space an open forum where we can talk and chat and if those of you who are interested in writing and are interested in challenging those colonial gateways through to public publication how we can support you in your writing in your thinking in the frameworks and in being published so there's loads of exciting things that this network, I think, can, can really run and grow. So um, really excited about that. And I hope you'll join me on the 28th of April. It probably won't be just me. There'll be others doing it as well. But really hoping that uh, we'll see lots of you there. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Matt. And just to emphasize, um, in our special issue, we. Uh, strongly encouraging different types of methodologies and approaches. So, um, you know, things that might be too unconventional for other papers, we're welcoming it. So please go wild and thinking differently um, about how to do things. Um, with that, we just want to thank you. Um, thank you all for staying till this late and um, please well, um, share the resources, um, fill in the feedback form, let us know how we can improve. Um, and yeah, definitely, def definitely go over the slide deck um, at your own, own pace and absorb the information we've shared. Nariman, any final words? Appreciate it. And thank you to Emerge Africa for the platform, for sure. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest thank of the day. Thank you. Thank you.